you're born, you have this moment where you, your eyes open to this world for the first time, and baby's eyes, have you ever seen them? They look like an intense, psychotic killer. They're just like looking around at everything, taking it all in. It's this new alien world that they're discovering for the very first time. And it's not long until we come to this point in time where as very small children, we're sucking in vast quantities of information, information that defines us and defines who we are and who we're going to be for the rest of our lives. Amazing defining moments like being in that gymnasium at school when you're going to play your first five-a-side indoor football match in the sports hall and you're lined up in this line and this brutal system comes into play which defines the rest of your life where there are two captains and they are picking one player after another and there can be this life-defining moment where you're the last person picked and you die a little inside and you're asking this question for the rest of the day why was I last? why me? And for some, that's a one-off encounter. For others, that's what they experience every time they play sport. For others, there's this piece of paper which marks the end of your work and says, well done, good, rubbish, who are you? Do you even attend my classes? There can be all sorts of things. At the end of our lives and the end of our, kind of, even our school life, sorry, we get these pieces of paper which have A, or if you're me, C, D, E. And letters lower down in the alphabet which shouldn't be seen on pieces of paper and that can happen and those things define who we are or even say the way that we look and media portrays certain ways that we should look ways that we should be and all these different kinds of things and when we look at our lives it's amazing when you come to think that those moments become defining moments for us or in class when we're lined up as children and told by our teacher to line up in tight order and the shortest person there dies a little inside and the tallest person has this huge I'm the best here even though really what value is it? What does it actually matter? But these kind of things define the way we look at the world and the way we see things and it was actually no different for Jesus and his disciples. A few weeks coming up to this grand moment which we kind of celebrate over this Easter period of Jesus' death and his resurrection. In the build-up to this moment, there were huge changes. You see, when they first started to follow this Jesus, <coughs> all of these guys were nobodies. Except for Matthew. He had a pretty good business. He was a tax collector making mad peace. But apart from him, everyone else was pretty much a nobody there. Nothing too special, nothing too amazing. And so they get this call to follow this Jesus. Now, what Jesus did at the beginning, it wasn't that revolutionary. There were many... Um, uh, rabbis who were seasonal rabbis. So they would work as a carpenter or various different trades, and then in a season they would do. They would become a rabbi. You know, my season for this particular time of work has come to an end. I'll volunteer my time to go around the community to share and to teach God's word and to fulfill His call upon my life. And they would get disciples around them. So when Jesus asked these guys to come follow me, he wasn't the first rabbi who just randomly started doing that as like a vocational thing on the, the, the chance and on the off chance in that moment. So for all these guys, they got this opportunity to follow Jesus. The reason that was significant is, especially in Peter's case, um, Peter was a fisherman, and the way their culture and society worked, that you did your exams and you learned the Bible, the first five books, off by heart, and then you were quizzed on it, and then you were quizzed on the commentaries of those, fo fo those first five books. And if you failed, there would come a moment where they'd say, you're not going to cut it as a Pharisee, you're not going to make it to be a lawyer. So you better go home and learn your dad's trade. So at some point in Peter's educational system, he's been told, you don't cut it. You're not up to the grades. Um, you're done. And so when Jesus meets him in this boat and says to him, follow me, Peter's response is, I'm a sinner. <coughs> and a sinner means to fall short. He says, I didn't get the grades. You don't realize who I am. And Jesus' answer is like, oh yeah, how silly of me. No, it isn't. He says this. He says, I will make you a fisherman. He's saying, I will make you something different. Don't worry about what your grade says. I'm going to make you something different. And so he does that with this ragtag group of weird individuals. But when they follow him, he's a nobody. He's a nobody. He's just a random guy becoming a vocational rabbi. Nothing out of the ordinary. But by this point, building up to this moment of the Last Supper, everything has changed. Jesus now has huge political social power. Um, the opinion polls are in his favor. Hugely. And now the other local leaders, the Sadducees, the rabbis, the other rulers in the temples and the priests, 
they're starting to realize that this Jesus has huge public opinion and public sway. So they start to feel threatened that he's taking their power away from them. And that this vocational rabbi has gone from being a vocational rabbi who teaches a few things about God's word to changing an entire nation and the direction they're going in and pulling them away from the teaching and, and the establishment. And he's a real threat to their business. And business is booming. And it's coming up to the most important time of year, which is Passover, where they make mad peas. And so they're really threatened by this individual and this group of people. Now, because he is now really important, they are now really important. And what starts to happen amongst them is they start to realize, wow, this Jesus is really going places. That means I'm really going places. And when they realize he's really going places and they're really going places, what we start to find happening in the, in the narrative is their attitude changes and there starts to become these discussions. This discussion is a key discussion which lasts for weeks. Who is the greatest out of us? Who is the greatest out of us? And Jesus says this. He says, you need to turn and become like a child. Turn and become like a child. When he chatted to Nicodemus, one of the rulers, as we looked back a couple of weeks ago, he said this. He said, you must be reborn. You must be reborn. And Nicodemus is like, how can I climb back up into my mother's vagina and come out again? Like, that can't, that can't be done. How is, how is that possible? That's, that's not possible, Jesus. You can't, you can't be doing that. And Jesus explains to him about being reborn, having a fresh start. And Jesus gives us a fresh start. And he says to them, you need to turn and be like a child. What he's saying is, you need to ditch everything you've learned from school. You need to ditch the lining up in the gymnasium. And you need to forget who's the tallest, you need to forget who's got the best piece of paper in front of them with an A on it or an A. Oh, you went to Cambridge. Oh, forget it. It's gone. This is his kingdom, not ours. This is a different kingdom. So you need to turn and be like a child. You need to learn a new way of living. You need to see a new way of looking at the world. All of that is gone now. It's, it, it, it's finished. We still live in it, but it's finished. Its actual value and importance is temporary. It's fleeting. It fades away. But Jesus and what he's going to give is going to be of eternal, which is longevity and quality. He gives us eternal life. So he says you need to turn and be like a child. You need to forget everything before. And they don't buy into this. They don't buy into it at all. Because a couple of days before this meal, um, John and James' mum comes to Jesus and says, she sees which way it's going. She sees he's having immense power. And she comes and says to Jesus, Jesus, may my boys have your right and your left and see in your new kingdom. May they be your right and left hand man. And Jesus says to them, hey guys, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? And they're like, we can. He says, great, you can drink it. But guess what? I can't give you those seats anyway. The father will choose. But then these guys here, hear what has happened with these two and their mum. And they are indignant, the New Testament says. They are vexed. <coughs> they are peed off. They are rubbed up the wrong way. And they are really cross that those two would have the audacity to try and claim power, which they've all been fighting for among themselves. And Jesus, hearing their indignation and their, their vexedness, he makes this statement. He says, you don't get it. In my kingdom, he says, it's the least that will be greatest. And he says, if you want to be the greatest here, that's great. I've got the commission for you. I've got the charge for you. He says, you must become the servant. And now when they get to this meal table, you see, this is the table where they would have, it, not exactly, it wasn't luminous yellow, uh, but it was a U-shape. It was a U-shape. So this is the table they had for the Last Supper. And so when it came around to the seating arrangements, you need to understand a few things about their culture and their custom. It's quite ironic today we've ended up in a kind of a U-shape here, which actually wasn't planned, by the way, but um, God is good. Old. So they've got this U-shaped table, and the best seat in the house is here where Jesus is. And then you have his right and his left-hand man. Now, the left-hand man is the most significant, not the right. So the most significant person at Jesus' table is Judas. And Judas, out of all the disciples, is actually the main man. And the reason he's the main man is none of them actually have a role or a title or a position, but he's the treasurer. He's in charge of the money. And what I want to say as a quick side note is sometimes what your position is is your greatest temptation of weakness. <coughs> because he was in charge of the money and he couldn't stop stealing it. And so when you ever get a, mi a ministry or a position or a function in work, in life, or something that you consider yourself a value of, I'm the tallest in the class. I've got an A-star. I came from Cambridge. I came from Oxford. All of a sudden, 
It's your greatest temptation to act like a real jackass. So, <laughs> Judas has this huge temptation with the money, and that's kind of his, his problem. So you see there, John, the one whom he loved, is at the right-hand side. And now the, the other seats, we don't know exactly where they sat, but um, speculation from various theologians says that these guys were in these positions. Peter, we know, sat here. And the reason we know Peter sat here is a really important reason, and that is that Jesus um, had this moment where um, he had to do something he should never have had to do. There came this moment where Jesus started to wash their feet, but the reason for that was, you see, when they came in, as they all came in as equals, there was no one at the, the establishment they took and hired that uh, was there, no servant there to wash anyone's feet. So Jesus recently has told them that if you want to be great among you, you must be the servant. And now all the seating arrangements happen, everyone's sat in their place, and Peter is sitting in what he doesn't realise is the most important seat of the whole table. It's where the servant would sit. And so Jesus has given Peter an opportunity to be the greatest out of all of his workmates. So he's sitting in the servant's seat. And what Peter does is with all the arguments going on and the power struggle that's been happening between all of them, he sits here, and he's probably vexed. He's probably vexed. He's like, Judas? I get Judas sitting there. I understand he's the treasurer. He's got a position. But John? Him and John were always kind of vying, although John didn't really seem to care too much about it. He seemed to be a pretty stand-up guy. But Peter, like, John, seriously, man, that should be me sitting there. I should be sitting on the right-hand side, or possibly the left. I should be there. Not these two clowns. Why am I sat here in the servant's seat thinking I'm going to go around and do all the servant's duties? There's no way that's happening. So there comes this moment before they eat, and they have to have their feet washed. Jesus has rode into town on a donkey. That means donkey doo-doo everywhere, open sandals, uh, donkey poo on your feet, <coughs> it needs to be cleaned. And the way their tables are is they don't sit at tables like us. Um, it kind of bends down, and they will be laying across towards the table, facing it, which is why it talks about John later um, in laying his head on Jesus' chest. They're kind of laying down here. And so everyone's laying down, their feet sticking out this way. And so what Jesus does, he gets up and he starts with John. And he washes John's feet. Then he washes Judas's feet. Then he washes Simon's feet. Then he washes Matthew's, James, Andy, Andrew, uh, James, um, Judas, Philip, Nathaniel, Thomas. And then he gets to Peter. And when he comes to wash Peter's feet, Peter is dying inside. He's dying inside because he's watched Jesus wash the feet of every single person there that he should have done by the position he was seated in and what he was meant to have done, and he didn't do it. And that is why Peter says to Jesus, you do not wash my feet, I wash your feet. And Jesus says this to him. He says, only, and then Peter says, um, wash all of me. And then Jesus says, just your feet are dirty, bro, I'm not washing you all. Um, get a grip. And then um, Peter says to him, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus says, I'm really strong. He says, if you do not let me wash your feet, you will have no part in me. No part in me. And I remember reading that as a kid, and I'd be like, Raw, Jesus is on a hype, man. That's a bit extreme. But it's not at all. Because you see, the thing is, Peter is still lined up in the gymnasium. Peter is still defined by the moment where he was told, go home and learn your father's trade. Peter is still defined because he's not the tallest. Peter's defined because he's not the most athletic. Peter's defined because he hasn't got the qualifications. Peter's defined because of his social standing as a fisherman instead of being a lawyer. Peter's defined by so many of these things, and Jesus is saying to him, unless you, wash my, let, you, unless you let me wash your feet, unless you realize that as the leader, you serve people and you look after their agenda and not your own, you have no part in me. You have no part in me. And the reason being is because in his kingdom, it's all different. He said this, Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, it is not the way with us, like the Gentiles, who have someone lord it over them. He says, no. He said, with us, the least is the greatest. You want to be the greatest? Pursue being a servant. Now, out of the group, there's really just two people who are kind of messiahs. And the two people are Jesus and Judas. Judas is kind of this freedom fighter. Judas is this rebel. But Jesus and Judas is quite similar because Jesus is known as the Christ. And Christ means chosen one. And Judas means praised one. 
Judas' name means praised one. And you know how we live our lives? We live our lives worshipping and following the praised one. God wants to call us to follow the chosen one. What we tend to do is we follow the hype. So if there's hype around someone and loads of praise around someone, we all step in line and worship them. If a teacher brings the tallest one there, then he's the tallest one there. If the teacher raises that person up as the greatest in the class and their academics achievements, they are the greatest in the class. If this person said to be the best looking, if this person said to be this, all these different kinds of things, we follow the praised one. But guys, Jesus is causing us to have a shift of one seat with our worship. He's causing us to shift from the praised one to the chosen one. Because in God's kingdom, all the values are different. And all the things in this world that we quantify as being great, he couldn't care less about. He could not care less about. And so they have this meal together, and they come to this moment where Jesus starts to talk about um, his, 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 his impending um, death and says that someone's going to betray him at the table. This huge riot starts out amongst all of them saying, that's not going to be um, me. I'm not going to be the one to betray you. I'm not going to be the one to do this. Peter swears by it. Um, Jesus lets him know about how he's going to screw up in the, in the coming um, days. And Judas is sitting with Jesus and, and John. And Jesus makes a statement saying that um, the person who will betray me will dip from the same bowl as me. Um, but the way the table and the arrangements are, um, it could have been any, anyone really on the table that could have done it. So we always read that and then it says Judas dipped and we're like, oh, that's so bait. How did they not just get up and murk Judas and beat the boo out of him? But um, it wasn't that bait. It wasn't that obvious. And so Judas um, has dipped from it and Jesus says to him, go and do what you must and do it quickly. And so they have um, this moment where Judas leaves. Jesus goes through um, the, the whole commotion of this Last Supper. And he does some really, really interesting things. One of the things he does is he grabs some bread and um, some, some, some wine. And one of the things he says about the bread is he breaks the bread. And as he breaks it, he says, this is my body broken for you. And for them, this would have been like a really crazy thing. Because this meal, the Last Supper, is really Passover. And so everything's about Egypt and the meal that they had the night before they were set free. And so Jesus is saying as he breaks this bread that this is about my body. This isn't about Egypt. This isn't about the lamb that was slain there. This is about me, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So he takes these ancient symbols which they really valued and he breaks it and he says, this is my body broken for you. And then he says, this is my blood poured out for you and for many. But then they'd have been sitting there like, Jesus, you're gas pump. This is about Egypt. This what are you talking about this being about you? And then he leaves, he goes to this garden, and in this garden, he makes this, this prayer to God, and he says, Father, is there any way this cup can be passed from me? But nevertheless, your will be done. Then Judas and his homeboys turn up, um, gang warfare, wrong postcode, wrong time, in the garden, Gethsemane, and they lead Jesus away. And Jesus said, they will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep will scatter, and all of them scattered. But John stayed fairly close behind. And Jesus was handed over. And as Jesus was handed over, he went through various different things, different um, uh, interrogations. First with um, Herod and then with Pilate. And when he's with Pilate, this amazing, amazing thing happens. Pilate makes a statement. He says, I find no fault with this man, yet I will whip him and I will punish him anyway. And um, what Pilate didn't realize what he was doing was he was actually fulfilling the rights of the, the priests, which was happening all over Jerusalem, um, as would have been happening about a few thousand years last Friday. And this moment where what they would do in the times of Egypt was they all took a one-year-old ram, male ram. They took it, one-year-old, it's the equivalent, um, like they have dog years, they have ram years, ram years. Um, is a man in his early 30s. The, the ram had to be male, Jesus, male, 30s. And then what they would do is they would take it to the house and have it in their house for three days. And what would happen is the ram isn't like this little pet lamb thing you think of. A one-year-old ram is like its peak. It's big, strong, huge horns. It would wreck the house. It would just knock everything over, cause carnage. Three days before Jesus is to go to the cross, he turns up at the temple and trashes the place. And he kind of does that. And then what they would do is after the three days, they would look at it, find there were no broken legs, no skin problems, nothing wrong with it. And they would say, 
um, it is without any fault, and they would whip it, and the blood would flow from its back, and they would say, this is sacrificially fit to be the Passover lamb. And so Pilate, after Jesus arrived three days early, he'd been in his father's house, causing trouble in the temple. Um, he's a 30-year-old male, and he's male, and he turns up at this, and he's before Pilate, and Pilate says this, I find no fault with this man, yet I'll punish him anyway. The Greek word for punish is to whip, and Jesus is whipped. And as he's whipped, the blood flows from his back. And as John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so Pilate was like a priest in this role of declaring this Lamb fit to take away the sins of the world. And so in this moment, Jesus is then hung on a cross. And there comes this moment where he makes this declaration and he says, It is finished. And when he says, It is finished, he's saying, Sin is finished. And when he's saying, It is finished, he's saying, There's a NWO, there's a new world order coming. And I've ushered in this kingdom of heaven that I've been speaking about. And the values are totally different. And the gymnasium line is done away with. And our beauty culture of having to look a certain way for magazines and to be accepted is done away with. And um, the education system of what's um, valuable to define you as more important than another is done away with. The business culture of people walking up to you and saying, oh, what do you earn? Or what are you worth? Or what do you do? is done away with. Um, all these different values that we invest in and we consider something is completely done away with in this moment where he <coughs> says, it is finished. And there's this huge paradigm shift that takes place in this guy, Peter, who finally starts to get it. Because when he writes his epistle, he makes this statement. He says, remember, you were not bought from your slavery with perishable things like gold and silver. How many, how many of us, I mean, I do this all the time, stress about money. And money is the top thing on our agenda. We care about gold and silver. And Peter says, you were not bought with perishable things like gold and silver, but you were bought with the new world order currency, the currency that really matters. He says, you were bought with the spotless and precious blood of Jesus. So through his blood, we have this redemption. And he died on that cross for us. Because as he poured the wine, he says, this is my blood poured out for you and for many. And so this time of year we remember that, but we remember his resurrection. And the reason we remember his resurrection is this, is his resurrection is the hope that you and I can be reborn. Now for some of us today, I believe what God wants to say to us is I believe he wants to say, to us the same thing as Peter, that unless you let me wash away your attitudes and you turn to me and become like a child and start to learn this new system and wrestle against the old system of what defines people and how we value them, but you define them and you value people with my blood, if you don't do that, he says we have no part in him, we have no place in him. So today, I guess, above all things, as we celebrate this time where we can have newness of life in Jesus, I want us to have newness of life in our worldview. I want us to no longer see people as what they look like. I want us to no longer see people as what they can achieve or what they've done by any of the ways in which we judge and value them. I want us to see people in one way and one way only. I want us to see people as people who have been purchased in the precious blood of Jesus. And that he has assigned that value to them. And if Jesus has assigned that value to them and to us, we have to assign that value to one another. Mm -hmm.